Jamie is back with you once again. And you know, one of the interesting things that comes along with the territory of, of doing these shows every week or so uh, is, is the interaction that I have with people who watch the show and, and, and some of the different comments I get either through, through email or, or through uh, Twitter, which a lot of you follow my Twitter account, I know, uh, or even through the, the comments pages on YouTube where these videos are shown. One of the most interesting things we see are, are those comments that we get from people. And one of the things I've noticed all along is that the, the comments I always get seem to be pretty polarized. Either you really like what I do, or you really hate what I do. And, and I can't say that's a surprise. I know that when you talk politics in this day and age, uh, some of that is to be expected. A lot of that's to be expected, I think. And, and to a degree, it's somewhat predictable, uh, at least to an extent, the reactions that I get from people. Generally speaking, people who are fairly conservative, such as I am, uh, give me very positive comments. And they'll say, you know, right on, way to go, that's exactly what I was thinking, keep, keep speaking the truth. Uh, that sort of thing. And I appreciate those compliments, and I appreciate those comments. And, and it helps me realize that I'm right on track with what I'm doing. By the same token, a lot of times when liberals uh, comment or, or email me or whatever, it's extremely negative. Uh, to the point that I probably can't repeat most of what I hear from liberals when they comment on me. But nevertheless, uh, as I say, it's part of the territory, it's somewhat expected, and to a degree, it's somewhat predictable. But today's show might break from that a little bit, at least in terms of the predictability nature of it. I'm going to talk about a topic today, gay marriage, that I suspect I'm going to get a lot of grief from both sides over. Now, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to explain my position on gay marriage and what I think about it. Uh, and, and I'm sure that when I do that, most of you on the left are going to absolutely despise what I have to say, and you're going to hate it and whatever else. Okay, I get that. I'm prepared for that. That's not really a surprise. But then after I do that, I'm going to explain what I think a possible solution uh, to this controversy is, and, and maybe what would be acceptable. And I have the suspicion that when I do that, that a lot of you on the right, a lot of you who are conservatives, who normally are right in line with what I'm talking about, I think there might be some of you that get a little bit angered and upset by what I have to say. I don't know that for sure, but that's kind of my suspicion coming in. So let me go through and explain where I'm at here and what I'm, what I'm talking about. And it'll be interesting over the next few days to see the reaction I get, certainly from the left to a degree, although I think that is a little predictable. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, who knows. But also I want to see the reaction I get from the right. And I want to see if uh, I'm really off base with what some of you guys think on this topic. Or if maybe there's more of you out there who think the way that I do. Be interesting to see. A little bit of a sociology experiment, I suppose. Okay, on to the topic of gay marriage. It's been a hot button issue for a while, particularly this last week. Since last Tuesday, uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in California overturned the Prop 8 ruling in California. Uh, that, that basically define marriage as between a man and a woman. And, of course, no real surprise from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. They've been known as the nuttiest court in the land for a long time. And that court essentially overruled the will of the people. They, they actually voted for Prop 8, and the, the court comes in and overrules that. I certainly find that a little bit distasteful. I don't like to see that. But I also understand that in terms of law, there are occasions where the proper legal course is to overrule the, the will of the people. I would hope that happens very rarely. I would hope that there wouldn't be very many of those cases. And I would hope in the isolated case that it did happen, that it would occur by constitutional means. Not really sure that happened here, but nevertheless, I know that there is some extent to which a court has a right to overrule the will of the people, so I will set that part of the argument aside for now. I don't really like it, but sometimes it happens. Okay, I get that. But the problem I have with this, and, and let me be clear, I am not a constitutional law scholar, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not, not an attorney, so don't take this as any sort of groundbreaking legal advice. That's not my field. I'm a layman of all laymen, so uh, let me put that disclaimer right out there. But I am someone who's looking at this through a bit of a, a logical frame. And there's something, when I look at this logically, that, that bothers me a great deal about this. When I look at this ruling, and I look at our nation, our constitution, our declaration of independence, and I look at the intent of our forefathers so many years ago, and our founders of this great nation, 
I'm reminded of something in the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence makes it clear that our inalienable rights are granted to us by God, that they are not granted to us by any sort of government entity or any sort of creation of man, but our rights come to us from God, and no government can take those rights away. To the extent that we have a government, to the extent that we need a government, it is to facilitate certain very specific things that we need to do collectively. Things like, you know, finance and operate a military, or, or things like, you know, to, to have a court system, or protect property rights, or things like that. Very few and far between. Our government was not meant by our founders to overtake the role of God, or to overtake the role of religion. It was instead just that the government is there to facilitate certain very specific things that the people wish to have. But otherwise, our rights actually come from God. They did not mean for a government to exist that would grant and take away rights. That's not what the government was about in their estimation. Now, we certainly as a nation have moved far away from that at times. Some of us are trying to get us back closer to that. But our founders did not believe in a government that can grant or take away rights. So, if we look at this from the perspective that God grants rights, government does not, then it stands to follow and it stands to reason that because rights only come from God, and because God, if you want to look at it that way, has authority over the government, the government does not have more authority than God. The government is lower on the totem pole than God, if you want to look at it that way. Because of that, it's unthinkable that a court or a government could force God to change his definition of a term. That's ludicrous. That's asinine. It's the height of arrogance and pompacity to think that a government would put themselves on such an equal footing with God that they, that they say, God, you have to change your definition of marriage. Can't happen. Absolutely cannot happen. No authority at all in the American government or any other government for that matter to force God to change his definition of anything. But yet that's essentially what the Ninth Circuit Court forced. They're basically forcing a religious concept, marriage, to be redefined. I don't believe that any court in this land or any other land has that authority. So that's the first issue I have. Now, a lot of you, and first of all, some of you are screaming, jumping up and down and screaming about separation of church and state. The idea of separation of church and state is an absolute myth. It does not exist in the Constitution. I'm begging you, go find for me where you see the word separation of church and state in the Constitution. It's not there. Now, some of you are talking about the Establishment Clause and the First Amendment. The only thing the Establishment Clause says is that the government cannot establish a church. Period. Nothing more, nothing less. It means there cannot be a National Church of America formed by the government. That, that cannot happen. That's all the Establishment Clause says. The Establishment Clause does not say that religious teachings or that religious influence cannot be used in the forming of law. It doesn't say that at all. If it did say that, then that would mean that we couldn't have laws against, against things like murder or against things like stealing or theft. We couldn't have those laws because pretty much every religion you look at has some kind of, of ruling or some kind of caveat against murder or against theft. Well, if we couldn't have religious teachings as an influence of our lawmaking, that means we couldn't have laws against things like murder or, or theft or rape or anything like that. Because the only reason that we know those things are wrong is because of religion. If it weren't for religion, we would, we would go do those things when we know. We'd murder each other, we'd, we'd steal, we'd rape, we'd do whatever, because we would not know it's wrong. So, it's ludicrous to think that you can't have religious uh, influence in terms of your lawmaking. Everybody who's a lawmaker is going to use their core values to form law, and for many of those people, most, dare I say, that comes from religious teaching. So, the whole argument of uh, First Amendment separation of church and state is absolute bullshit right there. It doesn't exist. Now, others are talking about the Equal Protection Clause in the Constitution, that somehow there's something discriminatory and in the way that, that uh, married straight couples are dealt with versus gay couples, that there's not equal protection of the law in, in, in the sense of marriage. I disagree with that. Uh, the equal protection argument is flawed. And again, I'm not a constitutional scholar, so, so don't take this uh, you know, to that extreme, but I'm not a constitutional scholar. But just common sense would tell you that that particular argument is very flawed because 
In this case, there is no discrimination. All gays and all straights play by the same rules as far as marriage goes. Anybody in this country who wants to can marry a member of the opposite sex. Likewise, any member of this country who wants to, uh, who wants to, to marry someone of their same sex is prohibited from doing so. Whether you're gay or straight doesn't have any, any part of it. Who you're attracted to or who you love or whatever has nothing to do with it whatsoever. Everybody in America has the right to marry someone of the opposite sex if they want to. Everybody in America is prohibited from marrying someone of the same sex if that's what they want to do. And the laws apply equally to everybody. There's no discrimination there. Everybody plays by the same rules there. So really the equal protection argument should not hold any water. The point of all of this is that my big problem with this ruling was that the Ninth Circuit Court essentially tried to force the religious community to change their definition of something. And the court does not have the authority to do that. Not a court here in America, and not a court anywhere else. The court does not exist that has that right. The government does not exist that has that right. Because at the end of the day, any government or any court is nothing more than a man-made entity. That's all it is. There's no... There's no special wisdom that judges have. There's no special wisdom that uh, government officials have over us. It's not the case at all. Only God has that. So that's where I think the ruling is flawed. So in making that explanation of why I'm against the Ninth Circuit Court ruling and against the, the concept of gay marriage, I know most of you leftists out there, if you're still with me, you're jumping up and down, you're screaming, you're going apeshit. I, I get it. But I think there is a solution to this problem. I think there is, uh, I don't want to say a compromise, but I think there is something out there that does make a little bit of sense for how to deal with the concerns of some members in the gay community. And that's where I'm wondering if the solution I'm about to propose might be a little bit disagreeable to some of you conservatives out there. It'll be interesting to see. First of all, let's look back a little bit. If you go back mm, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, uh, when, when topics like this first started to come up, a lot of people in the gay community who pursued this didn't really pursue it strictly in, in the terms of gay marriage, using that term. They didn't really pursue it that way. A lot of times it was pursued from the idea of civil unions, from the idea of, hey, you know, a gay person ought to be able to do what they want with their property and, you know, bestow it to someone else or to uh, allow someone to make end-of-life decisions for them or, or decisions if they're in the hospital and incapacitated, that sort of thing. And as much as it might pain me on some level to say this, when I look back at those arguments, there is some validity to those as far as I'm concerned. I think there is a legitimate property rights issue there. Not because gays should have any sort of special rights, I certainly don't think that. Not because anybody should have any sort of special rights. But I think a man's property rights are the most important rights he has. And I think that anybody, whoever you are, no matter how much I disagree with you or how much I might disapprove of whatever it is that you do, I think that you should have, you and you alone should have the right to do with your property what you wish. And I think that you and you alone should have the right to make the determination in terms of uh, if you're incapacitated and need someone to make you know, medical decisions for you or, or end of life decisions, anything like that. I think that you and you alone should be the person who determines that. I don't think that the government should come in and say, well, because you're this or you're that or you're whatever, we're going to restrict who can make those decisions. I think that is BS. So in terms of a property rights perspective, I'm actually in favor of, of what would be considered a civil union. Now, I don't know that I would use that term necessarily. Um, I, I certainly don't think that the government needs to endorse that particular type of lifestyle or or to give it any sort of, of societal approval, I think that's going a little bit far. But I think that strictly in terms of allowing any American citizen to determine what they want to do with their property and how, I think that's completely legitimate. And furthermore, I believe that any two people who wish to do so, whether, whether gay, straight, or actually I don't even think gay or straight should even enter into it. I don't think the idea of a romantic relationship should even uh, enter into it or who you love or don't love or whatever. That should be totally by the wayside. I think that any two people who wish to pool their resources should be able to do so, should be able to make that in the public record, and should be able for you know, the, the public record to realize that, okay, person A wants 
their property go to person B in the case of them dying or in case of a will or anything like that. Totally think that's legitimate. And I'm totally on board with that. And I know that saying that, a lot of you social conservatives, and I consider myself a social conservative, a lot of you out there are mad in hell at me for saying that. Or I suspect some of you would be. But uh, frankly, my issue with gay marriage has nothing to do with property rights. I think all American citizens ought to have the right to their property and do what the heck they want to do with it. My issue with gay marriage is strictly the use of the term marriage. Because marriage is a religious concept that, in the, at the risk of sounding a little petty, it's our concept, speaking of you know, the traditional religious American community, it's our concept. So really to claim what you're doing is equivalent to it doesn't make sense. It's, it's, not, it's not fitting that definition according to God and according to religion. So you should not be able to use that term. But I think that in terms strictly of the property rights, you ought to have the right to do whatever you want. And I don't care if you're gay or straight or I don't care how much I disagree with what you do in the privacy of your own bedroom, whatever. It's your property. You ought to do what you want with it. Let me put it this way. It has been uh, in the most recent few years that a lot of the gay community have, have pursued this from the angle of a civil rights issue. And if I can give you some free advice from a conservative, in the year 2012, when anybody starts to argue something uh, from the basis of it's a civil rights issue in this day and age, whether you're talking about gay marriage or whether you're talking about immigration issues or whether you're talking about economic issues or, or different issues in certain minority communities, when you use the term civil rights issue, I tune you out. And I think a lot of the conservatives do too. There's no doubt that our country has had civil rights issues in the past. No doubt about that. We've all read the history books. Some of you who are older have lived through some of those things. But that being said, and that being acknowledged, all of the civil rights fights that were worth fighting in our history have now been fought. And the good guys won. Everybody has civil rights now. So there does not exist a person in America who is being denied their civil rights. That, that doesn't exist. So to argue it from that perspective really doesn't make sense. But if you truly wanted to get support from across the broad spectrum, if you wanted to get support uh, from people uh, who are, are not agreeable with what you're doing in, in a sexual sense uh, or in a social sense, but you still want to get our support anyway because that's what you would need at the ballot box, then it would be wise for you to pursue this from the perspective of property rights. Because I'll tell you, I will never agree with your wish to get married. Because as I said, marriage is a religious term. It's a religious concept. It's a concept that does not belong to government. Government just facilitates it. It's a concept that belongs to God and religion. So you can't have that. But, while I will never agree with your wishes to get married, I will always agree with your wishes to do what you wish with your property. And to make whatever decisions you feel fit about your health or your uh, end of life or hospitalization or any of those things. I will always agree with your wish to do what you want to do in your will or when giving property to others. That's your property. You ought to do what you want with it. You'll never hear me complain about that. And I think those of you in the gay community, if you would pursue it from that perspective, you'll get a lot more support than you realize. And you might get support from some places on the political spectrum that you might not expect it. Particularly from some of us who are more of the younger conservatives. We're all about property rights. Your property, a, a man's property rights in 2012, your property rights are much more important than your civil rights. We all have civil rights. It's our property rights in America that are under assault. That's our focus. Now, if you'll pursue it from that perspective, you might get a lot of us on board with you. I know you'll get me on board with you. That's it for this week. Let's, let's, see, let's see the hate mail come in now. This is America's evil genius. We'll see you next